Okay. In this talk, I, I mostly focus on. I, I first have a short introduction. Uh, the, the title is not so correct. So uh, in this talk, I first have a short introduction. Uh, basically, the, the research application, for example, in uh, communication in optical interconnects. And then I discuss, uh, within the introduction, I also talk about what is a, a second photonics, what is a photon crystal. These are two main research areas within the physical <coughs> physical that, that I understand. So that's the introduction. Then I go through the, uh, the first research work that is silicon photon crystal module. And in this uh, work, we utilize the so-called photon crystal waveguide, which has so-called slow life to modulate an uh, optic signal. And then I, then the third part is a photon crystal superprism, the beep steering. Uh, and this has a lot of applications, laser radar and the laser beep steering. Then the fourth part is the mirror project. Uh, my part is working on integrated photon delay lines, second compatible nanomembrane. Then the fifth part is uh, some miscellaneous work in plasmonics and uh, laser LEDs. And uh, in the end, I will have a short summary to discuss some future works related to wireless. So uh, <laughs> this is a, a chart I would really like to start for my talk. Uh, in the past, optical communication people, we, we look at majority of the photonics people, they work on uh, telecommunication uh, applications, where you have, for example, fibers connecting different cities across continents, across or intercontinents. And uh, for to transmit optical signal through this fiber, you have to have different kinds of photon devices to generate light, to modulate signal onto light, to detect the signal uh, from light and then convert it to electric signal and deliver it into a uh, delivery data or works. So, uh, and uh, in, in recent years, we see a enormous growth in fiber to the whole. And see, this is from September of one to, this is all data to uh, March of seven. They claim at March of seven, about more than one million homes has already, in the United States, has already been connected to fiber to the whole. And uh, and uh, also, if you look at all the uh, connectivity, the internet connectivity at the U.S. homes, fiber to the home currently still only occupy about 1.2 percent. Majority is still in other. Well, yeah, about 25 percent homes without internet. But majority of other homes are connected with broadband or dial. So there's a we see a good trend for fiber to the home to grow. Also, we see a huge potential for fiber to the home to take over other uh, connect opportunities. And another part of uh, photonics applications in optical interconnects. And this shows the, the clock rate and the microprocessor, and the memory clock rate and microprocessor clock rate uh, growth trend over the years. This is also by old data, but you can see the trend is their gap is increased. And this, this, gap, this gap is mainly because of the interconnection uh, bottleneck at, uh, on those uh, uh, electrical lines, uh, signal lines between the microprocessor and the memory. So one way to solve this problem is to use uh, optical signal to transmit data between memory and the microprocessor, or even in more advanced the recent designs, we have multiple high performance chips. And those kind of chips, so the, the data communication requirement is even higher. So um, I think a lot of companies, including IBM and Intel, are very actively looking at optical interconnect technology uh, for future uh, high performance computing. And there was part in uh, this, uh, uh, this year's CLIO, which is uh, about 10 days ago. Uh, by um, MIT Linknet, they are talking about maybe the 2018 to 2025 time frame. There will be a need for such a high performance computing back where you have uh, 64 tires, which within each tire there could be uh, 56 or 64 
course. And so it's enormous, I don't know, six, uh, maybe 4,000, uh, what, 16,000 cores on the, on the back and the, the bandwidth, of course, the character so far. And so that's enormous bandwidth requirement. So for that kind of thing, you really have to up the So in the past, the optical interconnects start from very primitive. Well, if you look at today's high-performance computers, they already use optical interconnects, but not on chip, but using fiber connecting different big stations within their room. But in the future, when we have those kind of big chips or big backpacks with this size, with 64 types, like within each type you have 64 cores, then you need to have some integrated approach to deliver optical signal on a very small footprint. So that we have to use some integrated approach enabled by signal companies. And uh, when we talk about integrated approach, some ideas started very early about optical signal, uh, optical clock signal distribution. Um, in this could happen maybe uh, earlier than 2018 because. Uh, the optical signal, uh, clock, uh, the si clock signal on current CMOS chips is actually having a lot of problem because uh, the clock signal usually need to be delivered over a much longer distance from this side of the chip to the other side. So this kind of long interconnect suffers most of power consumption and many other issues. So they are talking about using the uh, uh, optical wave, building a wave wave back from this point to this point, from this point to that point, and to deliver optical signal. And of course, you need to generate, it. you need to first modulate this uh, electrical optical signal onto an optical wave and deliver to this place and demodulate it. So there are still a lot of research going on in that direction. So, that, so that, that slide is one aspect of what, what, what could be called as nanophotonics? Uh, is it, or, or is it not? Uh, it's, I'm still trying to figure out what it means. That's what we call it here, right? Nanophotonics, well, some people think in electrical field, uh, they always think if you are below 100 nanometer, then you are being nano. But in optical field, it's, very, it's not that easy to get below 100 nano. So if you look at, there, there are some truly nanoscale photonics devices, but they're not so very high. I don't think there's any hope you can use a, they are based on mechanical structures, metallic structures. So they can confine light in within maybe 20 nanometer, 50 nanometer uh, waveguide width. But the problem is when you confine light so small in their waveguide width, you cannot, I have never seen such reports say when you have such a lateral confinement, you can deliver light more than maybe 100 micron. Uh, which the same is, thing not in radio, you get below cut off the waveguide or you you have sub wavelength antennas have enormous losses. Yeah. Same, exactly the same physics. So, so it's, it's, it, it is uh, hard. So, but, so now our, conf our constraint of playing with optical interconnectors is uh, assume we have waveguides with about 500, 400 nanometer widths, and you need another 4, 500 to separate from another one. With this, well, the, the good thing about optical wave is it, Bandwidth is almost enormous. You can get 100 years within a single waveguide. So, uh, or in the future, maybe you get get 200 years using waveguides multiplex. You can get maybe terabits. So that's the advantage of using optical waveguides. Um, so when people say nanophotonics, they mean that's 400, 500 nanometer range. That's practical thing to come. If um, if you're doing, there are people talking about short. Short distance interconnect, but really for 100 nanometer, nobody is going to use optical. They are going to use electrical. Works perfectly fine. So this shows uh, a typical traditional fiber optic uh, wavelength division multiplexing network, which is being widely used in today's uh, metropolitan area network and uh, backhaul network. In this kind of network, you need a laser uh, to generate CW signal. CW uh, lab, then you you need a variable, you need a module, you need a modulator to modulate the light signal onto this uh, different wavelength. Then you multiply them into uh, a single fiber. That's uh, one big advantage of uh, optical trade. 
of your communication. That is, you can multiply, depends on how many, depends on your laser technology, you can multiply up to 40 and maybe 100 or even 400 channels of light into a single optical fiber. And in this way, you can easily transmit more than one terabit uh, per second signal. And this has already been demonstrated. It's not a future. It's already been demonstrated. And even more than one terabit has already been demonstrated. Into a single fiber, you can transmit over long distance. It could be uh, tens of kilometers uh, for metropolitan area, or hundreds of kilometers. And for long distance backhaul, uh, long haul backhaul network, you can go through tens of thousands. And of course, you need some repeaters, which basically is amplifier, to relay the signal, amplify the signal and transmit again. So it's already all being demonstrated. For example, if you are talking or transmitting data signal from from this cell, uh, from the United States to China or, or other continent, most likely, so absolutely, your signal is going through some fiber optic network and receives. So, and then, but. Here I'm talking about uh, the most of my network, where you have uh, many, many users in s subscribing to different uh, wavelengths. So each user, well, for small users, you may never get to subscribe to the entire wavelength channel. You probably only subscribe to one tenth or one thousandth of wavelength. But maybe for big users like IBM in a city, they may subscribe to the entire several wavelength channels. So you need to somehow, at a, a user site, you need so, to. So what's what's the VOA? Because VOA. Well, that's that actually that, that's uh, this should be a module. But VOA is some VOA could be deployed somewhere here. VOA is called a variable optical attenuator. So basically, if you have multiple wavelengths, you want to somehow balance the the signal intensity somewhat equal for some noise concerns. So, but anyway, so if you are a user. You, you want to access a particular wavelength channel. What you would do is uh, you, you need the edge of multiplex, which uh, when you see such a fiber, it takes a particular wavelength, take it out, and the job to your local user, and let all the other wavelengths to go through. And so the other users uh, at other places can access those other wavelengths without disturbance. And you also need an uh, optical modulate to modulate a signal at some user side. For example, if a user is not a passive user, they also need to upload some information. So he needs to generate a signal, generate some data, and module this data onto an optical wave, use such a logic, and send this uh, particular wavelength into this uh, fiber optic network, and then transmit it into this uh, metropolitan area network, and deliver it to another user or, or some server. And you also need some, in some cases, you also need a uh, uh, perhaps in central station, you need some uh, uh, wavelength division demultiplexing devices. You need to separate all the different wavelength channels into uh, 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 different outputs. And then at this end, this is a detector. So you can use detector to convert the optic signal back into the electrical domain. Then the electrical signal will contain the data in that. So, so basically, we need all this kind of technology. All these uh, optical devices to do the signal generation, uh, detection, and access applications. So, some, in summary, we need uh, this laser, which I don't work on. I work on this. Uh, I work on modulators and edge of multiplexers and demultiplexers. And of course, we also need uh, photo detectors. And uh, so that's part of the, the general research application uh, of my my field. And uh, then. Uh, I want to discuss two physical le level uh, uh, say, uh, two physical level research field that work. One is a photon crystal. What is a photon crystal? Photon crystal, if you assume, uh, uh, I think everybody had some physics at some point. So you probably all know this uh, periodic uh, dielectric structure. And if you heard about super lattice, uh, this is actually a one-dimensional uh, dielectric superlattice. Or if you uh, recall, there's some grating. Uh, grating is a one-dimensional periodic dielectric structure also. So this, this one-dimensional periodic structure can be thought as a uh, uh, photon crystal, one-dimensional crystal. But in, recent, in, in the recent wave of photon crystal study, we are more focused on two-dimensional periodic structure and three-dimensional 
called hydraulic structures. Why we need the higher dimensional structures? We see uh, some examples where two-dimensional, three-dimensional structures give you more design freedom. And, uh, and for physics, we find more physics and more fun. Yeah. So, <laughs> the radio guys have Yagi antennas. Yagi antennas have yeah. uh, photonic crystals in them. Yeah, I, I saw that, that some, yeah, I saw that kind of thing. <clears throat> so, but somewhat this is a little bit old, but one dimensional photon crystal can be traced back to this in 1887. But this kind of thing actually, this too is like started um, in 1987, so about 100 years ago. The key for this kind of structure work is your periodicity of this dielectric structure, the periodicity for this structure from this point to this point. So every unit set, um, its length is a periodicity. And for this one, the periodicity along this direction is this, along that direction. So your periodicity must, if you want your film crystal to be effective, your periodicity must match roughly on the same order as wavelength, so that you can have maximum uh, influence of the light. And uh, why this works? Well. Actually, it starts from pretty simple ideas. If you had this uh, physics, you probably all know that in semiconductors or in metals, uh, you have a periodic range, or in any crystalline material, you have a periodic range of uh, atoms. And this periodic arrangement of metals is uh, atoms in those crystals that is responsible for the band structure. That means that the electrons in such a crystal will have some region where you, its energy is allowed, some other region's energy is not allowed. So this region where energy, this energy levels or energy ranges where the electron can have, can exist in the, in the crystal, it's called the energy bands of the electron. And there are some energy range, for example, from uh, 1.2 EV to minus 1.2 EV to minus uh, 3. 3 EV uh, with respect to vacuum. That is not allowed, for example, in, in SIG. If that is the case, then this region is called band gap. So within this band and band gap, um, you can play a lot of tricks. And that's uh, what into the lot of semiconductor devices and the metallic devices. So the key here is once you have periodic arrangement, you can create some region where the energy is covered. Some other region, some some other range of energy is not known. So the same thing can be done in photonic structures, where you have uh, uh, periodic range of periodic range of the dielectric material. Then you can have some photonic, some energy range of photon can exist within this uh, uh, periodic structure in some other range. Well, in this range, photon can exist in this structure. In some other range. This range photon cannot get in. So what will happen when photon will not get in? That means if you have light impinge on this crystal, it will since light cannot get into it, it will be totally reflected. And uh, and this for two dimensional structures. For two dimensional structure only works for light. It's uh, perpendicular to this periodicity. So if the periodicity is in this x y plane, the if your periodicity is in the xy plane, so your light must also be in the xy plane for the periodicity to take place. And uh, to relieve this constraint, that means you want light to go, going out of this xy plane can also experience this periodicity. You have to have these 3D structures where you can have more complicated band gap. I don't want to go into detail, but that's a general idea. Uh, so using this structure, you can forbid light going to a certain structure. And that is uh, a useful way of uh, guiding light, as we we'll see in the next. You can think of this photon crystal as an optical insulator. So you know you have electrical insulator, electron, connected wire to it, electron, never gets it. So you can think of this photon crystal as an optical insulator. So when you have light, hit on this uh, optical insulator, it never gets in. It's totally bounced back. Now what is the use of this? What well, one use is you can put uh, a little void inside this crystal. Then 
light, if ever you can deliver light here, light will be totally confined here, you can never escape. And this will so form something called a cavity. You, you probably work with an electric cavity, microwave cavity. Microwave cavity can confine microwave in that little area and a concentrated high power effect. Uh, I have signal, I have uh, power here, then if you keep a little leak out of it, it will emit a very high optical uh, wireless uh, wave out of it. So here's the same thing. If you can create a little void or create a little space within such a three-dimensional photometer, so you have to confine up to it. Another idea is so that you put another, a little point here, but a, a line, a void line here. It's, they call it a defect line. Then light will be confined along this line. What that means is the light will only go along this line. So you're forced to go in this direction. This is a wall. This is a wave path. So a lot of things in are pretty much similar to RF wave uh, and the RF carriage. And But in reality, the photon crystal structure we can make in typical RF, uh, in a typical uh, microelectric foundry is like this. We have, for example, a ray of silicon rods on a silicon chip or a silicon or, or on an outside chip, or a ray of air holes in a silicon slab. Of course, all these things need to sit on something. Usually, we put it on the outside, a two micron thick outside, and this scales typical on the order of my, one micron or less. And thickness, for example, this is 200 nanometer, the air hole diameter is about 400 nanometer. And then some early demonstration is uh, why we need the photon crystal. The thing is, for example, if you have a traditional uh, dielectric crystal, <coughs> the light comes in, when it hits a corner, a lot of light will leak up. Because in dielectric waveguide, you are confined by so called. So, so that's the problem with uh, conventional optical dielectric waveguide. But once you have photon crystal, because this photon crystal will forbid light to go in. Therefore, you can force light to go through such corner. And uh, over the years, since it's uh, the start of the uh, idea in 87, this is uh, only recorded up to 2007, uh, we, there's a lot of devices being dem demonstrated in the home place on the home crystal structure, including switches, modulators, uh, lasers and photodetector, well, yeah, so photodetector. So, so over the almost more than two decades, a lot of uh, development has been made in this field. So we have a lot of tools uh, to be used in today's uh, application. Another area I'm working on is the silicon photonics. Silicon photonics uh, started, well, the, the recent wave of silicon photonics started in about 2007, when Intel published a paper in Nature saying they get the, the first uh, 1 gigahertz modulator in the The reason, if you look at uh, before that, nobody, not many people are working on silicon based problems. The reason is that first, silicon cannot generate light efficiently. There were, for many years, there were people working on silicon light generation, they get 1%. On the efficiency for LED, never laser. So, so silicon first is bad for a laser. Second, uh, silicon can make some detectors. So that part actually, we should give credit to silicon. You see, uh, today a lot of the places are made of silicon, but they are at, not at the telecom level because silicon has a band gap of one point one micron or so. So you can only detect wavelength shorter than. Uh, 1.1 micro. But the telecom will at it's 1.3 and 1.55. You can never reach that. But still, silicon detectors have a lot of application invisible. So that's why it's a very successful uh, technology. It's widely used. But for 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 signal transmission application, silicon is really a bad material. And uh, so first, it cannot uh, generate laser. Second, it cannot modulate the signal very fast. Not never get to peers before 2007. So in that year, was the Intel first demonstrated, a lot of people start to work on it. And next year, uh, the Cornell group also demonstrated one years. And then then Intel also demonstrated 10 years. And now this is on 30 years. Now the question is, we know we can 
definitely get to 10 years very easy. Now the question is how, how much power you can, uh, you need to generate 10 years of modulation. And so, so that's one part. So now, since we can modulate 1.55 micron uh, optical signal very easily on a second chip at 10 years or possibly above, so now it generates an entire new field called a second phenomenon. A lot of people work on it. And, uh, and so Intel, this is the chart Intel gave. I think I should put a quotation here. You can find this on Intel's website. So for silicon photonics, we need all these building blocks. We need to be able to guide light, and modulate the signal to light, and detect light, and uh, assemble various components into a real uh, pigtail or, or fully packaged device, and uh, maybe some uh, CMOS control integration together with the computer. And the most difficult part is this light source. So there are work at various different works based on, for example, attaching uh, three five traditional uh, three five material from for example gamma time based or even false five based uh, uh, semiconductor laser on the signature to generate uh, light work. So but other than that, most of this part are pretty well uh, well at least the principle and the early device demonstration has shown that this is entirely feasible. Uh, for the detection part, it's a little bit tricky because silicon cannot detect at 1.55. So people are developing silicon germanium, like germanium based detectors, but which can be grown on in a silicon, silicon compatible material. So that's uh, sort of uh, uh, all the building blocks for silicon. Um, so we are we work on this part and this part before. And, uh, and so this is a uh, Intel's uh, vision is uh, a little bit old, but they, they, they think uh, signal photonics can apply to enterprise communication, chemical analysis, and that's where the most important for this talk is the wireless and RF distribution. And you can use this to generate RF wave and, uh, and for example, video over fiber application and uh, optical interconnects and uh, environmental monitoring. And to do that, you need to put electronic and photonic device all on single second chip. And that is the key. The reason 35 uh, 35 uh, getting mass 19.45 based uh, integrated device can never take over uh, sick once the modulator on uh, silicon is demonstrated is that sick is so cheap you can you can build millions of uh, modulators on the sick at a reasonable price. But if you look at even neither or other things there's no, never a way you can get that cheap. So a lot of uh, old ideas, array-based ideas, and lithium it will never work because the cost is enormous. Now it can work in silicon. So, so this wireless distribution is part of this thing you were talking about? This I, well, I will show a little bit. Oh, okay. okay. So, so, so now we'll proceed to several detailed research topic I worked before so we can see what uh, the future uh, work we can derive based on this. So the first part is about some dispersive effect in photon crystal. The reason we want to come up with this uh, three-dimensional photon crystal structure or, or two-dimensional or three-dimensional photon crystal structure is that there are many interesting dispersive effects in this uh, periodic photon crystal structure. What is dispersion? Well, suppose the light comes into a photon crystal. You can put a wave back here, but if, or if you don't put it, it's also fine. Well, when light goes in, if you change wave length, it's uh, if you change its wave length, it's a uh, phase shift within this uh, uh, photon crystal will change. And this phase shift change from wave length to another wave length could be much more significant than there is no uh, photon crystal surge. This enhancement, this phase shift change could be 100 times more than without the or even larger. So this, this kind of uh, 
phase shift change is called, I call it longitudinal dispersion. Some people call it, some people related this to slow light. The reason you can have a significant phase shift is at some particular wavelength of photon crystal, the light, the speed of light of the blue plasma can approach zero or can be 100 times or 1,000 times smaller than the speed of light vacuum. And when that happens, you can have significant phase shift from with a sl slight wavelength change. So that is one part which I call longitudinal dispersion. There's also another effect called angular dispersion. We all know uh, if you have prism, and you didn't really sell experiment hundreds of years ago, you have prism, different color of light will be spread out. This is angular dispersion, right? So different color of light goes in different directions. In photon crystal, this angular dispersion can also be much, much higher. I see some, well, some of our research shows it can, well, in principle, it can goes to infinity. But due to some bandwidth limitation, you can probably get to 10,000 or even higher kind of enhancements or angular effect, angular dispersion. That means, for example, if you change your wavelength by one nanometer, that's uh, about 0.1% of wavelength, your angle change could be. Well, we'll see that uh, maybe 10 degrees or something. This is about 10,000 times higher than the conventional materials. So with this kind of a effect, you can actually not only use the wavelength to tune the phase shift or the angular uh, beam steering. You can also use uh, change the refract index of the photon crystal material to tune its uh, phase shift or angular direction. You were asking about this earlier. This is beyond nano photonics, because the size scale over which you have to draw a photonic crystal wound is nanometer. The uh, accuracy required for that. Right. The precision, the accuracy, right. the edge control, everything's got to be maybe, uh, tens or hundreds of nanometers. Yeah, nanometers. yeah that's true. Because you've got so many of them, if they're not right in the right place and just perfect, they're not going to work well. Yeah, I agree. So, so uh, just to get, get a, a high level application, so the application of this is like in waveguides? Right. So when you have that longitudinal dispersion, it can be utilized to make a very efficient module. That can reduce your device length, and that can um, <coughs> reduce your power consumption. Okay, for the second one is to steer the laser beam, and that is uh, used in laser radar. So in an RF radar, you need to scan the RF wave over some dome area to get the different signal returns so you know there's an air band coming back. Yeah, yeah. So in laser radar, you do the same thing. So, so basic principle uh, of slow light enhanced phase shift. Um, the f why, you know, f well, I just gave you an intuitive picture of uh, when you change wavelength and why you have phase shift. But if you want to look at it a little bit on mathematics, you need to look at the so-called dispersion relation. Dispersion relation basically says there's a relation between the, the frequency of light and the wave vector of light. Frequency of light, the oscillation, of how fast they oscillate in the high point. The wave vector of light is how fast they oscillate in the, in the space point. So this two oscillation has a, a relation that is described as this omega versus uh, uh, propagation constant beta. And so in for photon crystal, you could have a, such a dispersion relation where at some point of its propagation constant, the slope of this curve goes to zero. And this slope of this curve, which is delta omega, d omega d beta, is actually the good velocity. So when good velocity goes to zero, or this slope goes to zero, when you have a slight change of this, or slight shift of this, this dispersion relation, for slight change, this delta beta, which is given by uh, delta omega times this slope, goes to very long, or times the inverse of this slope goes to very long. So when slope goes to zero, we have small shift in this direction. The lateral change of the propagation constant is much larger. And the phase shift across the wavelength is given by this propagation constant delta beta times air. So when this becomes very large, at when the good velocity goes to zero, this phase shift is a significant effect. So that's the idea behind this slow die enhanced uh, uh, phase shift. And using this effect, 
with a very so when this when beta when gu velocity goes to zero, this phase shift. When this gu velocity goes to zero, this phase shift can be much higher. For example, one hundred times higher. So if this gu velocity reduces by one hundred times, at the same length, this phase phase shift will be one hundred times larger. So now we don't need this this length. We only need to, for example, by reduce length, we only need the Part. So we can re now reduce the length by 100 times, still get high phase shift. So that's the idea behind all this of slow light module. So you have photon crystal waveguide, and you, you have two photon crystal waveguide. And with this waveguide, you shift the phase by part, and with that waveguide, you don't shift it. So when they merge, their intensity will cancel. And if you don't apply signal, they will have the same phase shift, so the intensity will be higher. So using this phase shift, we can change this uh, intensity from high to low. This is a very basic uh, Maxander in front structure. So using this Maxander in front structure, you can modulate that signal from high to low, and low is achieved when the phase shift is high. And uh, the key using this for long crystal, again, we say is, uh, is due to this slow light effect, we can much reduce this length to achieve the high phase shift by one kind of time. If you do it well, you can get one thousand. So that's the uh, uh, idea. And uh, I ought to mention that in conventional photon crystal, uh, conventional wave you, you almost never get this. Because if you look at the uh, dispersion relation between omega and k or omega and beta in conventional wave it's mostly close to straight lines. You never get this kind of uh, slow approach to zero. That's a fundamental difference between photon you, crystal wave yeah, what signal that you apply is also light in this case? Well, it can be light, but we are mostly looking on electric signal. So, uh, so how do you change the how do you change the phase? That, that's actually your question. So we can apply uh, electric signal to inject carry into silicon, and we inject carry the refracting index of the signal will change. That causes the phase shift because the phase shift is equal to delta n times k0 times. So that delta n is the, the refracting index change. You can also change the refracting index by applying heat. But apply, when you apply heat, the speed up that you can modulate is very slow, typically on the megahertz. Use electric signal, you can get 10 years. But using light, you can also get very fast. Actually, you can probably get to 100 years or even higher. The problem is you have to first modulate your light signal onto that light. Then you use this slide, okay, so you don't want to do that. So, okay. So, yeah, so this chart talks about you can use thermal optical, electric optical, and you can also do optical tricks, which uh, is uh, not that useful. Um, so, this talk about, I don't want to go into detail, but this talks about all kinds of designs at the physical level. You can use PI dial or the bus canister to do all that kind of uh, things. And this is a, a device we demonstrate. This is a one gear, it's a photon crystal waveguide modulator. And we have two waveguides. The Maxander combiner will be this end, that end, which is not shown. So this is the one waveguide which is not modulated. This waveguide has its face module between zero and pi. So you can have, at zero, you have maximum intensity. At pi, well, if you do it well, you should get zero. But there's always some trouble to get. We're discuss about that kind of thing. So you get high and low, and uh, once you go to high, this is at about 2 megabit per second. This is about 1, one gigabit per second. You can see, when you go to higher, the intensity, the modulation depth will drop. And uh, typically, people define with the, the frequency where modulation depth drops by 50%. It's called bandwidth. So you can see, at originally, you have uh, about 80 percent modulation depth. When you go to high frequency, you drop to about, at one gear, you drop to about 40 percent. So that's a 50 percent drop. That defines the balance of the structure as well. About uh, one gear. And we compare this structure with some early demonstration of one gear is a modulator made by Cornell and the Intel. And our, our peak voltage is lower at the time. It's about two volts. And our modulation depth is reasonable, 42 percent. In many cases, you don't really need a, 100%, uh, unless, uh, particularly for digital modulations, we don't need a 100%. And our uh, structure uh, is about 80 
and they show some detailed electrical simulation of that. And more important, we discover scaling law, uh, which is actually pretty important. And from that, we first predicted that 10 years modulation signal can be done at 50 milliwatt without any enhancement effect. And then later, I think uh, IBM, a few months later, we published that probably in October or, or, or September. And they, about in November or something, in January, they demonstrated 50. Wow, really, wow. actually, they are so, so precise. I don't know. I don't know whether. But I'm sure they, they read our papers, and, uh, but they didn't quote it. <laughs> so this is now actually pretty important. You see, now today, you go to Clio. You see, everybody talk about <laughs> how to do it. And, uh, and after that, so the problem is for long haul communication, the power per bit is much higher. You, you probably can tolerate one, I forgot what's the number, uh, 100, uh, no, one nano joule per bit. But for on chip interconnect, the power requirement is 100 pico joule. That's about four or five orders of magnitude lower. So, so once you know this, and it, it really says whether it is possible to use this technology for on-chip interconnect. So that is the importance of this. What does it mean to discover a scaling law? You know, we, we in our field, people discover scaling laws. But what it means is that um, they express something with a lot of math, and they prove a theorem that says the following grows like O of some function of A. Okay. Um, uh, it means they have a model first, and then that they model, model and then they prove it's a mathematical, right. it's a theorem. Right. So, you know, something, so, so right. when this, you discover a scaling law, I think you need something different. So. This, yeah, this is a pretty simple, it's not that complicated, you need uh, 10 pages of uh, a theory to prove it. It's more or less uh, a single, it, it's quite, it's not that complicated formula, but nobody, Nobody <laughs> proposed this before. And since <laughs> we proposed it, and we, we are able to predict 50 mega, uh, a million watt per, uh, for 10 years modulation. So that becomes important. So, so, so the basic idea is that if you have, uh, we all know that to, to achieve this amount of uh, modulation, a reasonable modulation in silicon, you need a delta and the carrier injection about 10 to the 3 times 10 to the 17 on this order per centimeter of carrier injecting the silicon. So this is the number we know. Second, we know that uh, the time to inject the silicon, uh, to inject carrier into silicon is given by uh, this carrier density times the dimension of the silicon waveguide. So this is the total carrier divided by the current. So once we know the modulation, half modulation period, which gives you time. Once we, this is some fixed number. Then the only other thing is about, in this equation we don't know is the, the silicon waveguide dimension. But from basic optics principle, we know that silicon waveguide dimension, other than those metallic waveguide, which probably never be used. <laughs> so this, you know this waveguide dimension is on the order of about half microns. So because of all these numbers are sort of fixed, now you can derive relation once you notice a delta t, which is half period of your modulation frequency, modulation time. And you, this delta n is a fundamental number, already pretty much known. And you notice the core as an analyze is half of micron. And you know this q is the electron charge. Then you can, once you know this, you can find the current density. And once you know this current density, you can do some simple calculation show that's about 50. You, you know the current and then you know the power consumption. So that's the idea behind it. It's not a very complicated equation, but nobody has pay attention to that. So there's a, just because of this few simple facts. First, there's a delta n that is required, which is known. And second, the waveguide is about half my problem because of the principle of guiding by. And just based on this, a few simple observations, you can get a current density prediction. From that, you can predict how it's not that complicated, but okay. it, it's but so it's 50 milliwatts, say, surprisingly good result. 
for 10 gigahertz modulator? Or is it at that time? time at that time, it's a pretty good. Because if you look at the time when we propose this, people are using 20 volt of signal to uh, voltage you to, to modulate light. And, and the power consumption is on the other point, uh, maybe wide level. And so we first say, even without enhancement, you can get 50 milliwatt. And with some devices, they work on, they should get much lower than that. And so that's, and so that's the reason. And when, when IBM did this 50 milliwatt device, it's not enhanced. So this is the raw power. If they use enhancement mechanism, actually people are doing now close to 100 simple using enhancement mechanism. Anyway, that's so it. So you're talking about uh, 100 femtojoules per bit? Per bit. So that is 100,000 photons, roughly. That's, that's the other problem in optics. The photons are really big, so you don't get very many of them. It's 10 to the 18 per, per EV. It's about a 1 EV photon, right? So it's yeah. about a picojoule is, is a million photons. Right. They, they are talking about um, this part is in the electrical energy. So the electrical energy of power, that, that converts that basically says if you now with the, their scheme they can modulate ten years at about one million. So that converts to one hundred. That's electricity. Okay, that's electrical. But optical I haven't thought about. It's gonna be even less than that. So so beyond the modulator we can apply to optical interconnect. I need to speak up a little Optical interconnect, optical face array. This is actually one part of your project, which, but I don't have to share it. But we can also use that to, to make a spatial line module that is tunable uh, for non delay lines. This part of work out. So the third part is about photon crystal superprism beam theory. And so in the previous cell, modulator example, we already see using the slow light or high dispersion photon crystal waveguide, we can significantly enhance the phase shift in photon crystal. That's a longitudinal effect. Uh, we mentioned this uh, angular effect. How do we use uh, uh, what is the physical mechanism? Well, we already know the physical mechanism, but can we find a similar equation that is, can describe it? And before we did this uh, comprehensive work, no one knows what's a single equation to describe the angular dispersion sensitivity. We derived the first equation for it. And, uh, and so the, this superprism effect, as I mentioned, uh, is, is based on an analogy between a, a conventional prism and a superprism and a photon crystal. What happened is that there's a, there was an experiment done in 1998 uh, by NTP, uh, NEC, I think it's NEC and NTG. Uh, the experiment, I think, is done at NEC, I guess, but it has some joint publication with NTG. So what happened is, if you have a conventional crystal, when light uh, hit on this crystal surface, when you change the uh, instant wavelength from 0.9 micron to 1 micron, that's about 1% of wavelength change, you never see anything, never angular change of a beam inside this crystal. But if this photon crystal is entirely different, at 0.99 micron, light may go this way, and at 1 micron, the reflect light may go this way. The angle difference is 50 degrees. And if you come, if you draw that side, side side by side with a conventional prism, when in a conventional prism, if you change the wavelength from blue to red, you have about 100 percent change of wavelength, and your ang output angle only change by 10 degree, and you divide that by your relative wavelength change, you see you find this form, and this theta is expressed in green. And if you have photon crystal, it's entirely different. You change your wavelength by one percent you get angular square by 50, 50 degree. And if you express that in really and the rectal wavelength, you find that your equation like this. You can see there's a 500 times larger factor in this initial experiment demonstration. And later we mentioned that uh, we find that it can be even higher. So what, what happens behind this? If you look at the physics, it's because the, <laughs> the so-called dispersion surface in the photon crystal it has such a weird shape. You have these sharp corners. This is not sharp enough. You can find other dispersion surfaces. It's much sharper. And in conventional 
material, the dispersion surface is actually a circle. What is dispersion surface? Dispersion surface, I don't know if you heard about Fermi surface in, 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 in solid state physics. It's a constant frequency surface in the reciprocal space. Uh, <laughs> Okay, yeah. so, so anyway, you're saying that basically you are able to sort of do modulation, right? Right. If you change the modulation, modulation is much higher. Yeah. Right. The sensitivity is much higher. So if you so you can do it two ways. One is you change your wavelength, then the beam angle will change. Another way is you change the refracting index. For example, if part of this is silicon, you can inject air to change it, refracting out silicon so that the beam angle will also change. So there are two ways of doing this. And uh, this effect has been utilized to make a WDM effects. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, you need a wavelength demultiplexer to separate different wavelengths into different directions. They detect the signal carried on different wavelengths. So this is called wavelength demultiplexer. So they can use this effect because different wavelengths will sensitively go into different directions. So you can use this, this effect to make very compact wavelength demultiplexers. This is, this is a device demonstration uh, made by some other groups. So, uh, but the problem with this device is that, well, many people always ask this question. Slow light effect, a lot of people ask, is lost? The problem with slow light effect is uh, why we, I mentioned we can slow light by 100 times, but why we don't say 1,000, 10,000, maybe times? The problem is at 100 times loss is what people now, of course, the bandwidth problem. And uh, so a lot of dispersive effect always comes with this. So still today, I went to a conference, uh, call, a colleague asked me, what's the, what's the loss for this angular dispersion effect? What happened is I found that uh, we did theory that if you design right, you choose a proper structure, find the proper working point, you can almost make this device almost in principle lossless. And so this angular dispersion effect is different from the longitudinal dispersion effect. It can be all lossless. And the second question is what is the sensitivity limit? You see people reporting 500 times. And after that, I don't think many people get to 500. They get 200, 100. Sometimes they report the red code even higher, maybe 10,000, uh, 5,000 times, but never get to it. And there's no systematic theory that says what's the upper limit of this. What this enhancement depends on, depends on, for example, a slow life effect, we know very clearly, depends on the blue velocity. But here, what is the critical parameter, physical parameters that this enhancement depends on? So these are two critical questions. First, is this effect depends on loss, whether it's fair by loss. Second, what's the fundamental limit of this sensitivity? So we did this two work. First, we simulate the transmission. In, traditionally, it's been simulated by FDTD, which is uh, discretized space and uh, discretized uh, solve your max equation on this uh, discretized uh, grid, which is traditional. But the problem is this, uh, you can never go to large scale simulation, and which is truly needed in supervisory devices. So we're looking for a different sort of semi and lake method. And this is a really something I'm Pretty happy about this is a uh, this is a fundamental part actually in, in solid state physics, and uh, you have a this is a photon crystal and you have light hit on this semi infinite photon crystal from the bottom side and the light reflected. How do you calculate transmission? It turns out in traditional solid state physics, a complete theoretical framework for such a for first principle solution for such a problem actually does not exist. You can use a discretization, but that's not a unique theory. So we, we did a theory that shows if you have semi-infinite periodic structure, we show that for any periodic structure, any surface termination, any operation application, we can always find a new solvent. And, uh, and so in this way, we show the transmission actually can, uh, the, the high sensitivity Super prism effect can actually happen at almost low loss. The, the sensitivity is entirely unrelated loss. You can get a sensitivity as high as you want in ideal case. Uh, unlike in slow life, that's not 
<laughs> something to make mind more. You know, mm -hmm. basically you talk about sort of what is the, how do you skip, in my own right, sort of what we do is, so just transferring from one transmit element to a receiver, right. put multiple transmit elements and multiple receiver elements. Right. And, and what you can theory, theoretically show is that if you sort of use all these <coughs> M transmit antennas or elements to do the transmission and use the receiver on the other side, the capacity kind of scales with M. Uh, here I think the issue is more. Right? So, so I'm assuming that the sensitivity is something that sort of, it's like the number of angles or whatever, the, the range of angles that we can do. It's, it's more of a branch of angle in the, in the oh, well, it's a sensitivity of an angle. It's, uh, and, and, and uh, I've learned a, you a lot of, you need a lot of elements in photonic crystal to get a small angular resolution, just the inverse. Of the same same thing as the as you know, in that sense. You need a lot of them because you add up the, what you add up the reflections from all of them. You're making this direction thoughts, prohibited and this direction. It's more like you're using the crystal structure to make parts prohibited. Yeah. Some, some paths are extremely frequency. So now it's you know, but if a regular structure you for a single frequency you'll get one path. Some other different frequency will get a different one, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you're summing it all the way, slightly phase shifting, and they add up. No, no, so I know, but, but you're using crystal structure. Yeah. That's right. And it's crystal structure has to be regular and very big in order to get a small Do you agree with them? Huh? Do you agree with them? Sense. Are they making any sense to you? I, 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 <laughs> no, I, I, I'm a little bit lost on <laughs> So, so I know it's, it's not Nemo. Nemo is not worried about the phase shift of the individual. No, 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 right. it's not that. I was just concentrating. It's, like, okay. it's the typical Fourier transform thing. You need a lot, a big photonic crystal, to get a small angular resolution. Yeah, there, right. there are some other shifts uh, in photon crystal. That's exactly. the information stored in the crystal. Okay. Yes. One, one difference between a single one-dimensional world and this two-dimensional thing is because the photon crystal feel those space in one dimensional memory, array, you outside it, it's a uniform space. But in this structure, your your space is also feel periodic structure. So there's some trick you can play in that region. You know, so, so you can focus by some something you want to create a large number of yeah. parallel channels. So now it's if you could arrange the environment so that you get maximum. Right, right. That, right. That's what I was actually yeah. asking. Right. New York City is. So that's what I was asking. Are you arranging the structure to get like lot of? Exactly. I, don't yeah. want, I don't want to use the word diversity. But New York yeah. City. Yeah. The high rise well, in New York City. That's what I was like trying to ask. Crystal for wireless. Right. Yeah. A particularly badly uh, dis disordered one, but right. got the right idea. Yeah. So. Yeah, we can think about. It. So, so let's get back to here. So, the I, so we solve the first part, the transmission part. So, how do we solve the second part? The second part really needs to look at what determines how sensitive this beam can steal. As we said, it's because you have this sharp corner on this. So, so how sharp a corner determines how sensitive this beam can change, right? So, what? What what characteristic describes this sharp corner? It is actually the curvature of this curve. So there must be a relation between the curvature of this so-called dispersion curve and the sensitivity. And uh, I actually came up with this idea pretty early. And there's some relation between curvature and that. But I, I talked to another student while I was a student. I talked to another student. And he uh, asked whether he has time to work on it. It is so. So after about a year and a half, I spent some time and finally worked this out. And this don't have that equation, but this equation that relates this d theta d lambda, theta is the angle and lambda is the or d theta d n, and to the to the curvature. It turns out this equation is a direct proportionality. So d theta d, d lambda is directly proportional to uh, the curvature, and there are some other factors. And it turns out all these factors can be analytically expressed, although you still need to numerically calculate it. But the equation turns out to be pretty simple. And it's all tractable problem. So with this, we develop a two, two equation that show that this sensitivity is controlled first by curvature. And in some cases, also controlled by slow light. That means controlled by full velocity. 
But if you design well, you can use uh, a non-slow light case where the light speed in photon crystal is not slow. And the problem we, we want to, one day situations that we want to avoid, slow light. we all know slow light is effectively lost. So we can design structure without slow light, but with this high curvature to gender very high d theta dn. You can see the d theta dn is 10 to 5th or 10 to 4th degree. That means uh, a d theta dn is 10 to 4th. That means if you have 1% of dn, that's a 0.1% of dn, that's 10 to minus 3 times is 10 to 4th. That gives you d theta is 10 degree. So this is a much this is about four or magnitude higher than conventional material. So using effect, this effect can either uh, inject carry to change the wave, uh, change the angle or something. And the transmission is uh, pretty high. You can see over this range, well, this is a back here, this is a good case. Over this range, the T theta dn is pretty high and uh, your transmission is pretty flat. And if you look at the transmission, it's about seventy-five percent. This is not the optimized structure. And if you do it yeah, optimized, you can increase. The point is, it's not when this D theta DN goes too high, this transmission drop remains most at a constant. So this scaling is, is the most important thing. So we can see these are two, these two transmission and sensitivity are decoupled. You are not sacrificing this transmission to get higher sensitivity. So that actually answered the question that Colin guy asked, or and many other guy had in their mind. And there's a fundamental point, fundamental limit on this uh, super prism effect. Uh, and uh, if you are familiar with slow light, you all heard about this bandwidth. Well, it's not only slow light. In many other fields, in communication field, there's a bandwidth delay problem, right? The bandwidth times delay, you use anything to distort it. You may get high bandwidth by your delay become, uh, no, high bandwidth delay become trouble, and all you have the other way around. And same thing in this kind of angular dispersion effect. You also have the fundamental limit. That is your d theta d lambda times your bandwidth in terms of a weapon, in terms of a, a nanometer weapon. It should be much, uh, should be less than 180 degrees. So this is bandwidth. This is a correspondent of, of the, 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 the delay time. So you have this uh, fundamental limit in super fit. And this is also what we proposed the first time. And actually, there were, we submit this in a paper. It's a, it's a sort of review paper. But they, but they still ask a peer reviewer to review it. They say, this is so simple. <laughs> the problem is nobody proposed this before. You know, I, I think I agree a lot of other, lot, several other things I did, include this one. But we have more complicated theory to derive the, what's the d theta dn related to the curvature. That's a more intensive uh, mathematical work. But this kind of simple formula is really useful. <coughs> if you don't know this, like that power consumption, if we don't propose that, people are still doing all kinds <coughs> of things without quantitative study of what is a better silicon photonics possible for the But once we get that formula, now everybody is talking about people, only people join job per bit and whether it, it can really be the actual So I, I work on very complicated mathematics, but sometimes I think the most useful works sometimes comes up in simplest form. But anyway, so in summary, for slow light effect, this is something we have phase shift is related to Google, which is already developed by MIT group. And we derive this equivalent formula in for the super prism effect, which has this shape, which is, uh, I didn't show that. You can see this, this zeta is a curvature. And you have this mg. You can see this formula are pretty similar. You, they both have this factor. But the difference, you have this zeta factor there, and you have this tangent theta factor. Form. So this is a, actually a very nice theory. Uh, so how to make this kind of photon crystal? Uh, for super prism map. We tried several methods. One is a, uh, one is a sort of hologram method. You have multiple laser beam interference to create a 3D photon structure. And this shows the uh, measured transmission spectrum. Uh, another way is using nano neutron method, which you have a two dimensional, uh, you, I don't want to go into detail. Basically, it's a molding method. Uh, 
um, or embossing method, you have some structure embossed on a certain uh, substrate. You can press it against some flexible substrate, and when you fix that substrate by the shine, by either heating or shining UV light, then the structure will maintain shape after you take off this embossing substrate or mold. And I see piece. So. so this shows some a beam steering or superprism effect when measuring the nano structures. Uh, at the one wavelength light goes in this way, at the different wavelength light goes in that way. So you can see this is, of course, we didn't achieve uh, the highest uh, sensitivity as uh, promised. That was, uh, uh, that was something we still need to work on. So now we're going very quickly into the Murray project, integrated up to the lab. And uh, the key idea of using this uh, delay line, I tried to finish in 10 to 15 minutes. We started about 20, 30 minutes late. So, <laughs> so what is the idea of making this, uh, what is the usage of making this uh, integrated optical delay line? The idea starts from uh, uh, the, the application is in so called phase array canyon. Uh, today's radar, they want to steer the radar, radar beam very fast so that you can scan 300, I don't know, two pi uh, angle in maybe one millisecond so that uh, the, your airplane or whatever can respond very fast to outside situation. So how do you uh, scan this very fast? If you use a laser, uh, if you mechanically move it, it's not going to get you. You can never get to me. You, you probably can get to one millisecond. I don't know, depending on how big you are. So mechanical movement is very hard to get to me. The idea is to use a so-called phase separate. You all work on memo, you know. Uh, you, you can change the direct phase between your memo heads so that the phase interference give you a beam steering your outgoing beam in different direction. And the idea is very simple. If you have multiple slits, and depending on your face you're putting on different slits, you can change the beam direction. This is something you probably will learn in physics course. So for RF wave, if you have multiple antennas, by changing the face difference feeding into this RF antennas, you can change the outgoing beam angle. The, the angle versus your phase shift is given by this relation, sine theta equals theta phi divided by kd. D is the separation between your antenna heads. K is the 2 pi divided by lambda. And lambda is your uh, wavelength or RF wave. So this is a very simple relation. And uh, the problem is, in many applications, they want to change frequency from time to time. And when you change frequency, your, your angle is no longer fixed if your phase shift is and how do you make sure, even if you change your R frequency, your, your, your beam angle is still fixed, then you have to, rather than have phase shift to be constant, you have to make your phase shift equal to omega times a constant, which is called constant delay time. So only if you can achieve this, that is your phase shift is omega times a constant time. This is called a true time delay, only if this happens you can make sure your laser reader angle or beam angle is always constant, whatever frequency you choose. And so they want this, uh, so they want this kind of, not a phase shifter, but delay line. So the difference between a phase shifter is uh, over, this over this length, no matter what's the frequency, the phase shift is constant. The delay line is, uh, no matter what's the frequency, your time delay is constant. So, so now, once you know the time delay, you can express your outgoing beam angle as C times the time delay divided by D. D is your uh, antenna head separation. C is the speed of light. So now the question is, how can you generate a delay line? Uh, how can you generate time delay? You can use electrical things to generate delay. The problem is the electrical delay lines are always dispersed. That means you change the frequency of the delay changes, the beam angle changes. So that's not very desired. And even if you can electrically compensate this when you change frequency. That's still quite So people are using optical means to achieve this. The reason optical means can have much smaller delay time change is very simple. 
if you change frequency from one gigahertz to two gigahertz, and in the RF, your frequency changes and uh, how low it's 50%, 100%, right? Because that's delta G divided by one. G is about one, uh, 50%. But if you carry this RF wave on an uh, optical wave, you change your frequency by one gigahertz, you divide by the intrinsic frequency of optical carrier, that's 10 out of, that's one part of a meter. And all, almost all the dispersive effect scales with the relative frequency span, not the frequency scale. So for this reason, if you change your delay line from RF domain to optical domain, your dispersion could be four or five orders magnitude smaller. So that is the reason they want to use this optical delay line concept. And uh, so basically the idea is you have RF wave, you have phase shift, you carry the output wave and do the phase shift output and then convert it back. So um, now the question is how do you generate a sufficient large delay? I see there's actually, once when we had this uh, mirror project submitted, proposal submitted, during that period, DABA get out uh, a solicitation to make long delay lines. In our proposal, we propose 32 nanoseconds. And if you know that, you, you multiply by speed of light, that is correspond to about five meters of optical wave length. And DARPA has 200 nanoseconds in their first round. And the next time, they said, the they first one didn't select anybody. Then five, six months later, they reopened the application. Now it's 500 nanoseconds. Why, why I mention this? Because even for 32 nanoseconds or five meters of optical wave line, it's already very challenging for making a wave line chip. The problem is for such a long wave line, five meters of wave line, the loss will be so huge. I haven't. Well, first, you think about uh, uh, loss is one problem. Another is size. Five meters, you, you, are, you never have. Uh, integrate chip a five meter length. So the idea is you have to fold it back or do a certain whatever. But this part is not so hard. And you can also stack it up. So one layer you have uh, by folding back you can get uh, well, uh, okay, probably one meter on one layer. And then you can stack up to get five meter. But it turns out I mean I think within one layer you can already get five meter with a chip size of 10 centimeters by centimeter. So that's not a problem. The problem is uh, loss. If you look at the conventional waveguide Fiber is the best low loss wave. You can get less than 0.1 dB per block. But we are not, never get to that in integrated wave. Line. Because in this way, approach, they don't want fiber. We already use fiber to demonstrate that. So they don't want fiber. They want to integrate on chip and so that it's smaller and lighter than fiber. So, but the problem is integrated wave guide on chip, the loss is horrible. A lot of semiconductor wave that have 0.1 dB per centimeter. Now, if you have five cent, five meter, that's about 50 dB. Right? And uh, you can get some slightly better ones. For example, this silica wave that, but I don't think we're looking at this. And even with this, you have problem. When you have uh, such low loss wave that, the trouble is this: the index contrast is so low, so that bending loss. So you can get such longer wave that, but you cannot bend it in small readings. Then you have other problems. So, so there are some issues. So we are still working on this, and we had some ideas, but I think <laughs> it's. Um, By the way, this isn't good for just radar. Uh, <coughs> cellular aids. Is kind yeah, of for my mission. <clears throat> Not just for my mode, just for base stations yeah, to be able to inform you, the beam forming, and yeah. or just the yeah. tilt. Yeah. Two degree tilt makes a big difference on the, the interference in a cellular network. Yeah, exactly. It's a full RF beam. Yeah. Um, that's more general. Or just aligning them. They have to set a guy up a, a tower with a ridge to move it up and down a degree. And not even forming beams. You see. So you were saying initially you need that if you need to change frequencies. Yeah. No, you might, you might well, this if you want to inform independent of frequency. Change the antenna pattern. No, you can. 
No, he's saying that Volko, that's, uh, he's saying that if you change the uh, frequency of your transmission, your he says device. the beam forming gets screwed up. And they're right. saying this is a way to sort of make it robust. Yes, the whole that. idea is to right. right. But I didn't understand yeah, this part about doing RF over, 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 over whatever you call it. Right. Right. You call it RF right. over RF. Right. 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 This this some people call it RF tonics. Okay. It's delta F over F is very small. small yeah. So the changes that are frequency dependent don't matter. You're running an optical you frequency. Make typical delay lines yeah. that we make have one over F property. Right? And if you change from one gigahertz to two gigahertz, that's double. Right? So suddenly my delay is that being completely different. Half, you know, it becomes double. So therefore, this, the idea that at the base station transmitter you will have some You'll go to optical, do all the delays in the optical, and then convert okay. back to electrical, and then it doesn't depend on frequency at all. Your beam is always formed regardless. Because the gigahertz out of the terahertz. Like, but this is not what you were talking before your talk, right? That, that was something no, 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 that's, uh, that's something. Th th this is still for the beam form. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, people are saying that, I mean, even in terms of, uh, they talk about these cognitive radios, mm -hmm. and they can do frequencies exactly. everywhere. You can work. Yeah, yeah, completely exactly. mess up anything you want to do, unless you do something. Unless yes. you do exactly. exactly. That's what I was that's telling really you. Okay. If you want to do this, yeah, yeah. So eventually the idea is, uh, I don't know how electrically do it, but at least if this is true, if this can be... You know how they do it electrically? They got Quire. a thing with a screw and a motor. <laughs> okay. No, and not just that, they also do the coil. I mean, yeah. that's a simple you delay line. Coil. You do it with delay lines. Yeah, but then, you know, then that's very line. frequency dependent. Extremely frequency. The other way to do it is with a, with a coil. coil. I mean, with a, with a motor and a, and a weight guide with a chain. You know, and but, wait, but we still have that's a problem awesome. with the antenna. That's it. Yeah. We can do optical antenna. <laughs> yeah. So 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 the yeah, so it, eventually they want to have, I don't know, five hundred nanoseconds in a stack of this size or something. Right. So it's very light and can be of course they want to do a lot of airborne applications. So they, they really like this size. So this is Air Force project. Uh, so our idea or I didn't okay first I didn't pick this part. This is something I never imagined I would work on. At first, when I look at 32 seconds, I say, oh my god. <laughs> and when I say that part, so 200 nanoseconds, second, okay. Unfortunately, I haven't been either to work it out. But now I think there are some good approaches. I mean, there are smart people working on this field. And there are other applications once you get this or loss or that. Um, now it's becoming possible. The idea is, uh, I have several ideas. What is the reduced index contrast between the uh, wave that call and the cloud? The, the, it turns out the loss per sending of loss per bundle, whatever you call it, depends on this index contrast. If you reduce the contrast, you can get much lower loss. And it depends on, on uh, I think, uh, to the second order. That means you reduce this index contrast by 10 times, you get 100 times you get That's loss. Also in the roughness at the end of the rough, rough, roughness. I do have a, I, I still need to check, but I do have a, New theory. I know Marcus work on I actually read this book. And uh, and we, we do have theory. So okay, that's one part. The second part, if we do conventional things, it's never going to be that interesting. Academic research always needs something okay. fancy. So we use so called photon crystal wave back, slow light photon crystal wave back. The thing is once you have slow light, you can read Originally, if uh, this, you need five meters to achieve a 32 nanosecond. Now you can reduce it by maybe 30 times to within one meter, um, within 10 centimeters, or 20 centimeters. So that's the idea. Once you have that, you don't need a band. Okay, that's an amplifier. Uh, you need an amplifier. Well, so I'm trying to, yeah, another, I, this is reduced loss. Another idea is to use amplifier uh, to overcome the loss. So, do I have the next slide? So, the two approaches overcome loss. One is uh, reduce loss, another is increase it. <laughs> yeah, increase your intensified gain. So, so to reduce loss, uh, first you need to, for example, make this reduce the roughness. Second, reduce the uh, contrast. I do have a theory which shows if you just reduce roughness within the tech, all the possible technology, I know there's no way. <laughs> Unless you reduce the contrast, uh, even if you get one nanometer roughness, uh, well, the minimum you can get is probably 0.4 nanometer. That's a certain size. 
and uh, then within four four nano yeah point four uh, nano so even with that if you have some other numbers I can't get back with silicon silicon oxide don't call me yet but I think with that you never get to point one never get to point oh one D or something it's still possible to do thirty two nano but not possible for five hundred so that's it. Um, so we need to produce a contrast. Uh, actually, there there is a paper by Cornell Group. They did this very nice thing, and they used a very new wave back geometry and fabrication method, so that they can reduce the roughness to sub nanometer, at least a pretty low completion. Uh, so the same idea is optical gain. So you have basically, yeah, you you, you use gain to compensate loss. The good thing is, while the loss, uh, one thing I didn't mention, there's a catch using from crystal data. Why you reduce the length, the loss per unit length also increases, and increase with the decrease of loss. So eventually, the, the decrease of loss and the increase of loss per unit length, the a decrease of length and the increase of loss per unit just cancel out. So essentially, you don't get the loss advantage. You only get the advantage of the new size in slow life. Right? So there when you do quarters, huh? you don't need as many quarters. And that's a good part. <laughs> so the second part is uh, the compensation of the optical ga gain. The good part of uh, the slow life wave that is on not only is uh, loss per unit length increase, it gain per unit length also increase. So so basically, if you look at the overall factor, this mg times it, you only need to make sure your unenhanced gain is larger than the unenhanced loss. And then once this is a, become the positive, then when you scale, then when you do the slow life, you can enhance the gain, not enhance the loss. So that's it. And there are other applications. Uh, there are optical information storage, slow life effect. You know. the, the problem with the optical computer, one problem is optical how do you store optical information? You can store electrical bits at the pace, but optical wave never stops. Well, you slow light well, traditional. They were using slow light people, slow light people hope to slow light down to zero. Yes. I think it was skill. No, 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 no. Actually it's gotten almost to zero in gases. Right. Yeah. Uh, the wash is not so bad in the gas, right? Uh, the issue is the bandwidth delay part. Yes. They, they can't get a, a bandwidth delay part. Uh, so uh, interferometer based, uh, and there's a other application, for example, in GPS application, you need a, a, a segment interferometer to determine the rotation angle, and, uh, and you need a long waveguide on a small chip so that you can have maximum uh, sensitivity. I don't know much about that, but I know that can be done later. And there are some. So, hold on, so what's the last thing? RF information process? RF, yeah, RF information processing. So, once there, there's actually the same thing like before, what is yeah. it or something else? No, no, I mean, it's the same, same idea. You have RF filter. You know, in RF filter, you have intensity. You, you need to change the intensity, you need to change the delay to create a different kind of filters. So, actually, DAPA has a project using RF, uh, using on-chip second chip to, to, to do RF signal processing to create different delays and create the different intensity drops and Everything to shape the frequency. Some you have invariant, you know, delay it's invariant frequency, yeah. which is a beautiful. Right. Most of our filter design issues are so that you properly scale the frequency. So in the <coughs> next talk, I, I, Discuss a few miscellaneous part, uh, miscellaneous of projects I work on. Though this will be only one slide or two slides per topic, very quick. So as a negative, if you had heard about this case, the token is a very, very <laughs> active topic. You see, science, nature, calling cloaking. But this cloaking people started from a different idea of making negative index super lenses. I started in 2000, I think, from Pantry in uh, uh, University College, uh, Imperial College, uh, yeah, in, in England. 
they have this idea. <laughs> if you have conventional lamps, okay, the resolution of lamps is governed by something called the reading uh, limit. And basically, once you have lamps of finite aperture, this finite aperture will cause uh, ideal point image to be spread. That's because of diffraction effect, right? So once you have a finite aperture, the beam after going through it will diverge somehow, depend on how large the aperture is. It may diverge one micron, it may diverge one centimeter. So, so, but that's a fundamental limit, and it's the limit, limit all imaging system, including lithography system. So Pendry had this idea. That is, uh, if you use a different kind of lens, it's based on not conventional shape lens. It's based on so-called negative index material. This material in between is a flat material on both surface, but it has net refracting index minus one. Minus one means like in most material, in natural material, when I hit some material, you are reflecting that direction, right? you are reflecting this direction, but never, never goes beyond this central line. But the reason it can hit this way is because it's reflecting index is not possible. Connect. When you have negative index material, it will be reflected, but refracted in this way. This connecting refraction. And when you have negative refraction, light ray will be reflected in this way, and not the ray will reflect this way. They will have focus inside, them, inside this material. Then outside, they have another focus. This is the image. What Pendry said is that if you have such material, if you have two point source, the diffraction effect in this material could be zero. Ideal. Well, I don't remember when it's zero, but much smaller. And then with this effect, you can achieve rather than overlapping to overlapping light spots. You have no. So you can resolve this two point effect without diffraction. <coughs> they could keep called a super lens, a lens with super resolution. Now, because there's very little diffraction. The trouble is, there's no natural material that can give you perfect minus one refractive index. And even not a material can give you perfect minus something without imagine power. So what happened is, all this development was based on some material that can give you negative, real, negative, real part of refractive index, but with some imagine. And that imagine part kills everything. Okay, I'll just be honest. Be, 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 be frank. Uh, but still, some people are doing that. And uh, we are still doing that. We hope to find ways to overcome this problem. And uh, there are some other discussion why this truly could happen. And uh, there's a lot of debate following this. And uh, there were uh, some people are saying, Dr. Project Manager, who sponsored a later follow up project, on this almost get kicked out. <laughs> it works fine at microwave frequencies. Right. There's nothing wrong with the physics. You make the discrete, the discrete metamaterials they use for microwave frequencies. Right. They are. Those work fine. The, the idea behind this, I believe this is a better explanation of this, is, for example, if you have aperture, when you go out of it, the beam will diverge, depending on how large it is. You always have some convergence or diffraction. What happens is, if on the back side you can put some groove on it, then when light hits here, it will be side coupled to this. So now, instead of have a very narrow slit, you have all this area radiating. And when this happens, the effective aperture is much larger, then you can have a, a much smaller diffraction or much smaller uh, divergence angle. So that's actually the true idea. It's not because of the negative index, in my opinion. It's all because of this. Uh, that's, that's not it. anyway. So what what happened? How light can couple to this? It only happens if this magnetic uh, it's a so-called metallic material. There are some surface plasmonic waves on this surface, and so that you can light can effectively <coughs> couple to this surface mode. Then you have this surface mode radiate, and that can give you. And this is a, a this is a structure, super lens structure. Uh, a Berkeley group uh, demonstrated. You have uh, nano, they, they, they drive these very thin nano characters. And how this, uh, these lines are probably 
I can't remember, 50 nanometer thing or 20 nanometer thing, on a metallic, uh, on, on a resist, then they have a metallic film behind it, then have an image. It shows that it does give you higher resolution. It's, they call it one, one, one sixth of the uh, So it's not infinitely small, maybe due to all kinds of reasons, but still better than conventional structure. So, and of course, our range, we have a lot of other demonstrations. So, we show that not only in metallic structure, but also in photon crystal, you can have negative refraction. For example, if this region, this photon crystal, when light hit this surface, it refracts to this direction. So, this is negative refraction. Marginally, ideally, uh, normally, it should go that. But it goes this way, it shows this negative refraction. Actually, people also demonstrated such a uh, Reduced divergence in a photocrystal wave You have photocrystal wave and you have this surface periodicity. When I hit their sur surface, it will be coupled to the surface movements. So, not only in the metallic structure, this kind of coupled in black can also have it can also have in columbus structure. So, I had this project with, uh, with uh, one of my former classmates who, who demonstrated this work. And um, we developed this idea, which uh, was funded by NASA before I joined Rutgers, in the SDI project. So we have this photon crystal, we want to put some mechanic structure or mechanical structure on top. So hopefully, like this surface will couple with the plasmonic structure waves on this metallic uh, grating so that you have uh, an emitting from a much larger layer and you can have uh, better, uh, lower diffraction. So we did some simulation and it shows some uh, focusing effect in photon crystal structures. Anyway, so the, 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 the next idea is uh, this is something we still, I mean, uh, I, I had a collaboration with uh, Muna, Muna Innovations in Virginia, and uh, they are trying to utilize uh, such uh, metallic or metal material structures for 193 lithography lens applications. So uh, this is the STTR project. And I uh, hope the contract will be approved soon. That the, 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 let's say uh, guys on OCLTT or OTS is working on the contract. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so I work on several other projects like optical agile multiplex. This is what I said when you have the user uh, want to access uh, a fiber with multiple wavelengths on it, right? In it, you, you want to select a particular wavelength, take that out. So you need a so-called edge of multiplexer. You need to drop this wavelength. So this is the edge of multiplexer I developed in 2001. We actually patented it. So you can have, uh, for example, the light coming, multiple wavelengths coming from the uh, optical fiber. Then most wavelengths going out through this, this fiber, and one wavelength is dropped through this fiber. So this is a detailed inside structure inside this tube. And we show the particular wavelength is dropped, all the other wavelengths transmit through. And this is a, the transmission of this port, only at this narrow band. So this is basically an optical narrow band theater, uh, but uh, designed for optical WDM applications. And we also developed a more fancy structure using photon crystal. So this multi-channel we went to multiplexing. Yeah, I don't want to go into detail, but this is a, <laughs> this is a theoretical. The right hand side is theoretical. And we also developed the <coughs> photon crystal slot group. If you don't have this middle slot, this is just regular photon crystal we have. So I guess you haven't yeah, I haven't shown such photon crystal we have picture before. So this is a conventional wave that connect to this photon crystal wave. So this section is photon crystal wave. Basically, if this if this region also has holes, this is a photon crystal. But you remove this holes, it becomes photon crystal wave. Then you can play more trick like we did. We put a slot here. The, the reason we want to put a slot here is that actually people are putting polymer into this slot to uh, to if this is electro optical polymer, you can modulate the refractive index on module electro optic polymer to make a module. So, and you can also do sensing. We actually patented this structure. 
uh, for, uh, for optical modulation quantum effects. And this shows that uh, the optical intensity is very high in this slot. This slot which the optical intensity is much higher. And there are some mode mismatch problems and we find some way to solve it to reduce the loss. So that pretty much finished it. And now we 